Hi, and welcome to Next. I'm Sean Darrington, Group Product Manager here at Google Cloud. Today, I want to cover three different things. One, I want to share some storage best practices around data analytics and cloud storage. I then want to share a little bit of insights around stateful workloads in GKE, as well as some considerations for storage and data protection, and actually give you a couple demos. And then lastly, I wanted to focus on critical applications and different design considerations that you may have for storage, as well as, again, data protection. So with that, let's jump right in. You know, there are a lot of opportunities to gain more value from your data but you have to get the data into Google Cloud before you can begin to run many of our analytics options between Looker and Vertex AI and BQ. And so storage transfer service enables you to do exactly that. We have the opportunity to move data from on-premises, S3 compatible object storage into Google Cloud. We also have the opportunity to migrate data out of other cloud providers into Google Cloud storage. So once you get the data into Google Cloud, now you have the option to actually make sure you know who's accessing what data and where they are. And that's where the integration into our IAM, the Identity Access Management, comes into play. You have the fine-grained multi-tenant capability between projects to define who has access to what data. But then we're also focusing on with cloud storage, how can we make your life simpler? Simpler in a variety of ways, and that is number one, making it easy from an operational perspective to get data into cloud storage. Instead of going through data migrations and changing from structured to unstructured or vice versa, Things like Hadoop and Spark, we actually give you the opportunity to use the same file system structure, HDFS, but now you can just transition and simply use GS colon slash slash and begin to run your analytics from there. Again, making it really easy to begin to gain value from the information you have. But, but we're also focusing on how you can take advantage of optimizing your costs across multiple storage classes within cloud storage. Whether you're looking at standard or nearline or cold line or archive, you have a single set of APIs across all of those. So from an application design perspective, you have one bucket, one set of APIs, regardless of which storage class is actually satisfying those requests. But we're also focusing on not only the cost and design application, but also the response time. One of the most important things from an analytics perspective is, can I get consistent millisecond response time from standard all the way down to archive? And with Google Cloud Storage, you can do exactly that. The other thing we're doing is focusing on operational simplicity. That is, every organization is trying to reduce costs over time. With AutoClass, we give you the opportunity to hit the easy button, to turn on at an entire bucket level, whether it be millions, billions, or trillions of objects, you have the opportunity to turn on AutoClass, which will now migrate objects from one class of storage to another by policy without any intervention. And as we migrate storage from standard all the way down to archive, there are no deletion fees or retrieval fees that you may have from an early deletion request of data that might be resident for only 30 days instead of 60. These are all things that make it very easy to optimize the storage costs and where those objects are over time. And this is something that we've recently announced and it'll be excitingly available in Q4. The other consideration is how do you get compute as close to the data as possible? And with cloud storage, you can certainly have a single region and run all the analytics in that region, but oftentimes you want higher levels of availability if something impedes or interrupts that operation in a given region. And so with cloud storage, we've had the opportunity to define dual region replication for years. Strongly consistent replication with a recovery time objective that you can basically design a continental scale bucket, regardless of where the data is being served from, the application doesn't know. But what we've done recently is actually introduced enhanced options so now you have nine options for regions within three continents to choose for that dual region configuration. And you can continue to use that replication that's strongly consistent if you want to. So if your objects are in, in compute in region B, need to be retrieved from region A, that can easily be done. But if you need an extra level of availability, you can also look at the optional turbo replication. This gives you a 15 minute RPO SLA. So now combined with dual region replication, you have a recovery time objective of zero for your continental scale bucket, but you also have now a recovery point objective of 15 minutes. And last but not least, as you look at this design from storage transfer service on the left-hand side, getting the data into Google Cloud Storage, looking at how you replicate cloud storage across two different regions, the different options you have for analytics, whether it be Vertex AI or BigQuery, you need to think about performance. Everybody wants their data more quickly. And that's where we come into play with our cloud storage option. You have the option to scale that performance almost as much as you need to. 
We have retail customers today that are using our cloud storage with analytics that are exceeding 10 terabits per second of throughput. Now, not everybody's gonna need that much throughput, but if you do, it's an option to design your application that way. And last but not least, regardless of what type of analytic workload you're using, BigQuery or Vertex AI, this is all supported with cloud storage. So many times shifting gears to GKE, many times organizations are looking at stateless workloads and that's been the way that most people have been using that. However, we're seeing more and more customers thinking about stateful workloads where if the pod goes down or that namespace goes down, you can't just regenerate that data. So you have to think about things differently. And that's where backup for GKE comes into play. This is now an offering that we've recently made generally available. It's integrated directly within the cloud console that you can choose to protect your Kubernetes environment in a few mouse clicks, protect it locally, protect it across another continent, just depends upon what level of recoverability you wanna protect against. And this is something that we do from a very fine grained policy definition perspective. So whether you're running and supporting persistent disk, you have the option to protect a single application, multiple namespaces, or the entire cluster if you want to. And we have application consistency as well for many of the options so that you can have a crash consistent backup for some, but in some cases you actually want an application consistent backup. Some of the policies that we've actually introduced and give you options for actually protect against ransomware as well. So time lock is a very popular feature that people use to actually apply to a given policy that says, regardless of who wants to delete that backup, it cannot be deleted until the time lock expires of say 90 days. So ransomware may try to, but it won't be able to. So now I wanna introduce Manu Batra, who's gonna do a demonstration of backup for GKE. For the backup, demo we're going to do uh, we're going to create two clusters one a primary cluster called postgres cluster we're going to create the cluster in a rapid channel with 1.24 next we'll enable the backup for gke add-on we'll select specific machine types in this case e2 standard 2 and our cluster is created now let's create the secondary cluster Again, in rapid channel with 1.24, with similar machine types, enable backup for GK. So now we have two clusters, one for backup, other we're going to restore that backup. Let's log into our primary cluster, deploy Postgres. Let's log into Postgres, create a table, and insert some data. Let's insert learning GK is fun, database on GK are easy. So when we take a backup and we restore, we'll check if the same table with the data it can be retrieved on the restore cluster. So now let's go to backup for GK, create a new backup plan. We have two clusters. We select the cluster we want to backup. We will give this backup plan a name. It's a Postgres plan, backup plan. We select the target where we want to store the data, and we have the backup plan. Let's take an instantaneous or a quick backup. This is a manual backup. We'll give this backup a name. And let's check if our backup's done. Our backup has succeeded. Now let's walk through the process to restore. Let's create a restore plan. Let's select where you want to restore. We want to restore all the namespaces in the backup. We want to create new volumes on backup. So we're selecting all the options for creating a backup plan. Let's keep default for restoration rules. Now let's go back to backup for GKE. We have a new backup for GKE, restore plan for Postgres. We have a new backup. Now let's restore this backup with the plan we just created into the new cluster. As you can see, our restore was successful. Now let's log into the new cluster and see if the data that we created on the primary cluster and all the config has been recreated into this new cluster. So my Postgres workload is recreated onto the Postgres cluster restore. All my config, storage classes, settings, BBBC claims are also restored. 
and the data that I took a backup for is already available. So that was a quick demo. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, Manu. Stateful workloads obviously have to be protected via backup for GKE, as we just described. However, if you're thinking about multi-writer applications, oftentimes pods need access to consistent storage. They need access to persistent storage, and that's where FileStore comes into play. FileStore is an NFS managed storage service that you can use for GKE, and we have been able to do this for a while with, C with the CSI driver, the Container Storage Interface driver. We have some new news that we've announced regarding FileStore Enterprise and some options there, but if you think about how you can have tens, dozens, or even hundreds or thousands of pods accessing the same data, that's what we provide with FileStore. It provides highly available storage, so if pod one goes down, pod two still has access to the exact same NFS mount point. And from an operational perspective, FileStore supports non-destructive upgrades. So as we add more features over time, we incrementally improve FileStore, that upgrade is gonna be non-destructive to your environment. You don't have to plan for downtime when you're, when you're doing this. This just happens in the background. The other option, depending upon the level of applications you're running and the availability requirements, is FileStore Enterprise actually has a 4.9 SLA. That regional SLA ensures that data is replicated across three zones within that region. The new option that we've introduced with FileStore Enterprise is multi-share. This is the option for you to take a FileStore instance, let's say one terabyte, and carve it up into smaller shares to provision across multiple pods. So now you can provision as little as 10 gigabytes per pod that your admins need. Very simple to do, you create a storage class, then your, your GKE admins can then create PVs and begin to consume that. But let's dive into a demonstration and take a look at this in action. In this demonstration, I want to show you FileStore Enterprise and the new multi-share capabilities to use with your GKE clusters. So let's get started. Uh, so first of all, we're actually going to create a cluster uh, in GKE. We're actually going to use the autopilot capabilities to make things uh, simplified. Uh, I'm going to call this cluster uh, stateful cluster. Uh, I'm also going to use uh, rapid channel for the file store multi-share feature here. Uh, this is going to enable us to not only create the cluster but then make sure that the cluster is uh, properly connected. So I'm going to click create here and uh, now I'm going to begin to configure the managed storage uh, with FileStore. This is going to use a CSI driver, the um, container storage interface for this. It's going to make it really simple to do. I'm um, also going to show you the YAML file here for the storage class. Um, this shows you the storage class is using FileStore Enterprise, which is important, but you also want to make sure the multi-share is set to true. This is going to give you that functionality to have the smaller shares um, down to 10 gigabytes, if you will, within uh, FileStore Enterprise. Um, now, once I do that, now I'm going to actually run the PVC uh, YAML file, uh, and you'll actually see that I'm going to do this with a single uh, persistent volume uh, in, in, in this provisioning process, and eventually be bound to the cluster. Uh, now, you can do this with multiple PVs if you want to, uh, but in this instance, I'm just going to do uh, one PV uh, and 100 gig uh, of the multi-share within FileStore Enterprise. Uh, now, I'm not going to actually show you some of the YAML files for the reader and writer deployments. Uh, the reader pods uh, are actually going to be exposed by the load balancer for users to view. And this is what I'm going to actually show you at the end here to show you how uh, the multi-writer capability of FileStore supports this. Um, we're going to just choose uh, 20 writer pods. Uh, these will all simultaneously write to the same shared storage every 30 seconds. So in this case, it's writing to that one PB uh, FileStore Enterprise that I created uh, every 30 seconds. So I'll refresh it so you can see uh, that increases. Uh, also skip the, uh, the YAML file for the load balancer. Uh, this basically just exposes uh, the reader pod to FileStore. And here's the URL that I clicked on to actually show you that I've got 20, um, uh, 20 writer pods writing. And as I refresh this, you can actually see that it's recording all the writers that are writing to the shared NFS file system, uh, the enterprise uh, uh, that I just created. Uh, it'll actually show you when I refresh this that the same um, uh, writer host names match each other as you go through this. And that's as easy as it is to use FileStore Enterprise and the multi-share capabilities. Great. The last area I want to share with you is some best practices with storage and critical applications. One of the things that we've been focusing on with critical applications is our block storage offering, Persistent Disk. We've recently announced HyperDisk. HyperDisk is the next generation Persistent Disk that we've kind of rethought what block storage should look like in the cloud. We think it should be able to be dynamically provisioned. With block storage and particularly HyperDisk, we want to give you three dials, if you will, to turn, IOPS, throughput, and capacity. Based upon how you need to size your application, you can tune all of those independently. But we also want to give you the ability to tune those across a wide variety of workloads from throughput-driven workloads to IOPS-driven workloads. 
And we want to make it easy for you to manage capacity at scale. Managing 10 terabytes of data is very different than managing a petabyte of block storage. And that's where we've recently introduced Hyperdisk Extreme. As the name implies, it's going to satisfy the most demanding IOPS-driven database workloads like SAP HANA. And that's going to be suited for a percentage of applications, but really the top tier percent of applications. We're introducing and announcing Hyperdisk Balance as well. This is going to support the widest range of applications from throughput-oriented to IOPS-driven. And last but not least, we have uh, Hyperdisk Throughput, as the name implies, those that need gigabytes per second of performance, not necessarily IOPS-driven performance workloads. So all of these we've rolled out over time. Hyperdisk Extreme will be in preview this quarter. But underlying all of these is really about how you can optimize the storage utilization with storage pools. With storage pools, you can think about thin provisioning as we're used to in the on-premises world, now brought to the cloud. So you can create a pool of storage, allocate that storage to multiple servers, and essentially over-provision storage and only use what you need to use. Thin provisioning brought to the cloud with storage pools. But let's take a look at what this looks like in a SQL Server provisioning environment. Today, with persistent disk, on the left-hand side, there are a variety of steps you need to go through. Different persistent disk options have performance characteristics. You have to size the VM accordingly, and you have licensing implications oftentimes associated with the, v the vCPUs that you're provisioning for that application. And if you get it right on day one, that's great. But if it changes over time, and you have to go back and reprovision re performance and reprovision persistent disk, that can oftentimes cause a lot of complications. If you look at the right-hand side, Hyperdisk dramatically simplifies this. You have those three knobs, IOPS, throughput, and capacity to turn on day one to provision what you need based upon the application requirements and size the VM to what the v application needs, not what the block storage needs. Additionally, over time, after month six or tw month 12, you can actually dynamically change that performance characteristic, IOP, throughput, and or capacity as needed. So one of the things that Hyperdisk Extreme is very well suited for is the most demanding database workloads like SAP HANA. This is an architecture for SAP HANA that's highly available within a region, but then also replicated to a second region for full disaster recovery. As you see, the HANA database is supported with Hyperdisk Extreme, doing synchronous replication with HSR. Now, that's covering the database side of things, but what about the shared files, those combination of media files, app server, et cetera, binaries that need to be used for SAP. That's where Filestore Enterprise comes into play. Filestore has four nines of regional SLA availability, which means that we're synchronously replicating across three zones within a region. So if the media server is in zone B, goes down, the media servers in zone A have access to the exact same data. Recovery time objective of zero, recovery point objective of zero, just like the HRS replication of the database layer. But thinking about the database and the app and the shared file use case is important. We also need to think about backup and DR for the entire system. And that's where Google Cloud's backup and DR that we recently announced comes into play. This is one of the things that now within, directly within the cloud console, you can choose and set a policy to choose GCBE, GCE, other applications and databases seamlessly protect locally and or remotely. So combination of Hyperdisk, file store, and Google Cloud Backup and DR, you can protect the entire critical application environment. And with Backup and DR, we have a continuous incremental backup strategy. So you're going to maximize that storage utilization either in region or across region, in addition to having very fast recovery time objectives based upon that incremental forever backup policy. With that, Thank you so much for joining me today. Please check out Google Cloud's channel on YouTube for additional tech demonstrations and deep dives into many of the technologies and topics that I touched on today.